These interviews seek to connect veteran knowledge with the issues young people face today, and few are more qualified to make those connections than economist James K. Galbraith. His father, John Kenneth Galbraith, was one of the major figures of the mid-20th century American economy, considered by many to be the finest in the nation's history, and is one of the most widely read economic thinkers of all time. The apple didn't fall far from the tree. James K. Galbraith got his PhD in economics from Yale, became one of the world's leading experts on the subject of inequality, wrote many of the top-selling books on economics himself, and today is a professor at the University of Texas at Austin. Dr. Galbraith has provocatively proposed we are living in what classical economists would have considered a rentier economy, and that taxation should be focused on land rather than incomes. His thinking is very different from neoclassical orthodoxy, but it comes with an understanding of economic history few can claim to possess. Dr. Galbraith, thank you so much for being here today. Well, thank you for that over-the-top uh, introduction. Um, let's begin at the beginning. Um, I'm going to go out on a limb and suggest that the family you were born into may have had some influence over your direction in life. And uh, speaking as a Canadian, I know that you also have some family connections to both Canada and the United States. So perhaps you can talk a little bit about your family history and what conversations around the dinner table might have been like in your household. Well, they certainly weren't about economics for the most part, because uh, my father's interests were very uh, wide ranging. Uh, they were, of course, mainly in the areas of politics. And uh, at the time I was growing up, we were closely allied on the you know, question of the, our opposition to the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. So I have a very strong memory of, of, uh, of, of that influence. At the same time, though, the, uh, the, the fact uh, that my father was uh, perhaps the most prominent economist uh, of the second half of the 20th century meant that as a very young person, I was uh, exposed personally uh, to um, all of the leading, uh, let's what we would now call heterodox economists of, of that age. And, uh, these were people that uh, came in and out of my life um, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, in a, in, a, in a personal way. And I'm talking about people, the Cambridge leading figures at Cambridge of the time, Nicholas Caldor, John Robinson. Mm -hmm. uh, I went to Cambridge as a first year graduate student in 1974, uh, you know, listened to their lectures and met people like Piero Sraffa. Uh, and at, at Harvard, which was a much more diverse and interesting place then than it has become, um, uh, People like Vasily, I was. I took a course with Vasily Leontiev, um, and uh, one can just go down the list um, and uh, figures of that generation who were, uh, you know, formative influences on me. Uh, and that's probably uh, it, to some, in some distinction from my father directly, uh, where I uh, where I linked into. Uh, into the practice of economics and political economy. So it wasn't so much that your father was guiding you along the way as you were in that realm, you had lots of different influences and that piqued your, your own interests and, and sparked your own direction. Yes, that's right. Hmm. When your father was first coming into prominence as an, as an economist, uh, John Maynard Keynes was kind of the dominant voice at that time. Um, there, Keynes believed that in the 21st century, we'd be working very short work weeks. Uh, he prophesied something like 15 to 20 hours. Um, and your father, he died quite young. Keynes died quite young, but your father, of course, lived into the Bush years um, and uh, saw the prosperity boom of the mid 20th century. Also, some of the issues of inflation in the 70s, the neoliberal turn of the 80s, the Clinton consensus in the 90s, the changing schools of economic thought. Uh, what did he make of the way economics was going and the way the economy as a whole was going as we moved into the 21st century? Well, these are two very different things. Uh, the economics profession uh, entered into a period of, of essentially retrogression mm -hmm. uh, in the beginning of the early 1970s uh, and uh, proceeded to uh, marginalize Keynes and to attempt to marginalize my father, something he anticipated, by the way, by, hmm. by writing for a broad audience so that it would be harder for uh, to, 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 to ignore him than, than if he simply wrote for academics, who can um, easily make the choice of what not to read and what not to cite. 
but he 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 managed to uh, uh, work around that particular obstacle very effectively. But then, nevertheless, the economics profession became essentially a uh, it reverted to the very simplified ideas uh, of the late nineteenth century, early twentieth century of the uh, of the Alfred Marshall, uh, Leon Valras type, uh, and. Uh, what is essentially an 18th century manner of thinking about uh, the, the tendency of a system to be, move to its own uh, steady state, to its own equilibrium. Uh, these were th this was a this was an idea that predates evolution, predates the emergence of of modern scientific method, and completely runs completely at odd with at odds with the evolutionary uh, traditions, historical traditions, the reasoning that motivated Keynes and that my father was brought up in uh, with. So um, these uh, these things are uh, are very much, uh, um, let's say, uh, it's, a, it's an unhappy history and it's left the economics profession in a state where it really has very little to say about the world. Now, other part of your question was, how did my father see the, uh, uh, the ongoing evolution of uh, of our societies, uh, uh, and I, I, it's, it's fair. And, and in relationship to Keynes's vision of a kind of measured society, I think it's fair to say, uh, without uh, characterizing it too uh, you know, with too much uh, simplification, mm -hmm. that K Keynes had a gentleman's view of the way in which things could go. He liked the life of uh, of, of a, an Edwardian era academic, and he thought perhaps that uh, um, that, that that was what everybody else would like too. And so the the the, uh, uh, the notion of of short hours and uh, um, and and leisure and culture and so forth is very important to Keynes. Um, it, it, it it's fair to say that our North American culture has so taken us in quite different directions, partly because. Uh, the, the economy itself uh, has not generated that kind of um, of easy lives uh, that uh, Keynes hoped for and foresaw. Uh, um, partly because we're you know, over in this part of the world, we're not in Europe. We're spread out over very large territories, uh, and we live in and the large parts of the population live in suburbs, and uh, and the work has become. You know, it's it's not the work is not factory work. It's not it's not it's not the kind of physically uh, uh, debilitating work. Some of it is, but a lot of it isn't. Um, and so uh, there's a um, uh, the, 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 the cultural and social evolution has taken quite a different path mm -hmm. from what Keynes foresaw. Mm -hmm. um, you of course have focused a lot of your own work. Uh, on the topic of inequality, you've you've literally written a book, actually a couple of them on the topic of inequality. Um, four or five of them, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, I believe it was about forty years ago when you held a major conference on the subject of inequality, spearheaded a major conference on the subject of inequality. This was right at the very beginning of the of what we today might call the neoliberal era. Um, can you talk about a little bit of what you were seeing at that time? What you were thinking and and what concerns you maybe had about the direction moving forward in the early 80s oh in the early 80s uh, well i was very young and i was working on capitol hill uh and um, um, initially in the um, house banking committee and then uh, beginning in 1981 i was the staff director of the joint economic committee and i was working for a very um engaged and erudite and uh, uh a member of Congress. A two, erudite is not a term one normally associates with members of Congress. <laughs> uh, but uh, but Henry Royce was really quite a remarkable individual, um, and uh, uh, it wasn't a conference. He 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 uh, directed me to organize a hearing uh, on you know, the question of of inequality, increasing inequality. This was in I think the early part of 1982. Uh, and I, you know, to be honest, it was not something that I thought would um, be very interesting. Uh, really? uh, I'd just come out of graduate school. Uh, there was no sense at that time that uh, there had been much movement of 
in the direction of inequality. I mean, it's in the same sense, increasing inequality at that point. It was already occurring. Uh, there was virtually no professional attention. That didn't happen until the middle 1980s. And so it was quite difficult to find a witness uh, or two who could speak to this. Uh, and the ones we did find uh, who, were, who were actually quite good were, uh, they were not well-known people. Uh, so the hearing did not attract a lot of interest. Uh, but it, uh, it, it, it did sort of rest in my mind as a, 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 an object lesson that one should, one should look for the obscure topic. Uh, and the person who was working on it who uh, may not be attracting interest or prominence, but nevertheless is ahead of the curve. Um, and it was quite a long time later and after I'd come to Texas, um, in the middle 1990s uh, that uh, I began to uh, really engage with the subject myself. Uh, again, it was, it was partly uh, induced by uh, uh, an offer to, to, to fund a monograph, uh, which eventually came out as a book, uh, Created an Equal. Um, they, um, but looking at that, I, uh, at the problem, I realized that there wasn't enough information. Uh, there were some there was some inspired, uh, let's say, uh, descriptive work, uh, some general sense that things were really changing, that the country was becoming much more unequal. Uh -huh. um, you know, but there wasn't enough you know, clear cut evidence. Uh, and so then the question came up: How do you how do you acquire that evidence? What do you do? Uh, and I worked on that problem and uh, had the assistance of some very very uh, talented and uh, dedicated students. Um, and we came, we came across some appropriate ways of proceeding. Uh, and uh, for uh, twenty five or so years after that, uh, it was the main main line of my. My, my academic research was, was just pursuing the question of, of getting good measures that you could compare across time, across countries, and really get a sense of what was going on in the world. So at the time, the, even the way of analyzing the subject of inequality was not sufficient. We didn't have the tools available. And you would contrast, of course, you've done some of the work on honing those tools yourself and coming up with some of the measurements that can be used yourself. Um, can you talk a little bit about how that can how our current picture of inequality especially perhaps in the united states but also globally as well um how that compares to what we understood in the 1980s uh, what do we know about inequality today what is uh, uh and how does that contrast with how things looked at the start of the neoliberal era well in the late 1970s i remember one of my academic advisors saying you know just dismissing the subject that's like watching the grass grow uh, <laughs> nothing going on there, move along. Uh, wow. And at the time, it uh, wasn't entirely wrong. There, there wasn't a lot. Well, first, there was very little work, so one didn't know. But there also wasn't a lot of sense of evident, clear evidence that this was something that was, that was, that was significant. As the neoliberal period unfolded, uh, they, the neoliberals essentially came up with their own story about what was happening. Uh, and that um, really became the, 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 the fulcrum of my, uh, my own point of departure on this. The story was that uh, the markets were demanding higher levels of skill. And therefore, uh, those who uh, prepared themselves properly would do very well. And those who didn't would do very poorly. And this was what was uh, uh, driving uh, the the so-called labor market uh, into higher levels of inequality. And this is a very, um, this is in the nature of an apologia. This is in the nature of a, of, a, of a rationalization for a phenomenon. It's very convenient. It says there's really nothing going on here. People, uh, well, something is going on, but people are being paid according to their productivity. Uh, technology is simply changing the terms of that relationship. And so, uh, if you don't prepare yourself, if you're not amongst the small group that can get the skills in there for the higher level jobs, um, it's your problem, it's your fault. And so uh, again, it was, it was uh, a, a, a kind of invitation to complacency. Um, I, I didn't like that very much. I thought that, that, that it was, it was, it was a, I looked into the evidence behind that and discovered it was exceedingly thin. Uh, and based on a 
on the idea uh, that wages are set by this process of supply and demand in a whole bunch of separated labor markets, uh, each of which operates according to its particular technologies and the particular group of people looking for jobs in that market is a very inchoate vision. Hmm. Um, and uh, so we built up a much more consistent and richer body of evidence about what was happening from one period to the next, one year to the next. In some cases, we get, get data and now look at what was happening from one month to the next. And what we discovered was that they really, they, there's a, that it was really returned to uh, or an extension of uh, the vision originally put forward by Keynes. And I didn't realize this until after I had the evidence um, that what you're looking at is that distribution is 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 determined by what's going on, by the conditions in the larger economy, by unemployment, by um, uh, by interest rates, by the exchange rate, by uh, uh, by uh, to some, to sometimes by the extent of labor activism and organization, um, and so being able to to see what was happening from in the evidence. Uh, in some sense, built back up a, a, a you know coherent theoretical vision, which is unified, which doesn't say there's micro and there's macro. So it's basically one economy, and what's going on uh, in the economy as a whole is going to govern what's going on in terms of distributions internally. Um, and you know, so we, we initially did that for the United States, and then becoming ambitious and discovering that data were of the kind that we needed were easy to acquire. We went on and looked at other countries, other regions, and eventually at the world as a whole. And you found that those patterns fit beyond. Oh, the sure. Yeah. Oh, sure. 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 It's a global economy. Uh, and so it's easy to see when you find major turning points that they're related to global events, which are characteristically financial. Mm -hmm. uh, not always. I mean, oil prices, for example, play a role, but but financial events, the great debt crisis in the early 1980s, the collapse of the of, of the socialist uh, uh, governments and regimes, uh, and then they lead up to the Asian crisis. Uh, this led to a period of, of, of uh, comprehensive increases in inequality around the world. Um, and then there was a period after 2000 when it, when it uh, basically there was another turning point and it, things, things improved a little bit. They didn't come back down to where they'd been, but, they, but for at least 10 or 15 years, things were in most countries, um, they were, they were uh, not getting worse, in some cases getting better. Hmm. Hmm. Um, I want to get into a subject that relates to this a little bit. But it has to do with connecting past to present. It's something that, that you've written about a good deal, which is how uh, a lack of economic history, which was a, a staple subject when you were studying economics, um, has kind of thrown out the concept of the rentier. And that the rentier is a term that we probably need to be bringing back today. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about what a rentier is and, and why people might need to know what that term means? OK, so um, they in the tradition of political economy, uh, there were um, three major social classes, uh, each earning their incomes uh, on the basis of different principles. And the working class uh, earned wages, uh, compensation for labor time, uh, and uh, there were certain lines of argument about what would determine what those wages were. Uh, the merchant and manufacturing class earn profits, compensation for capital investment, for organization, for entrepreneurship. Um, and there was a general idea that they, if that world was was in fact competitive, that they would they would all, it would be a tendency for that rate of profit to be more or less equalized across all kinds of activities because capital would flow where. Uh, it was most used, uh, most profitable, and away from things which were less so. It's a reasonable approximation to begin with. Mm -hmm. And then there was this third category, land landlords. Uh, and landlords earned rents, rents that were based strictly on the differential productivity of their soil. Uh, and you can think of this in terms of you, you apply the principle to urban um, uh, land as well. You can apply it to uh, to technological rents, which is say the advantage you have when you when you 
float a new corporation with a with 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 a technology that wipes out uh, some previous generation of of competitors. Uh, but broadly speaking, the the the, the historical concept is land. Uh, certainly, mineral rents is another example. But basically, you know, that it's 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 the difference between the the the, the price at which you sell. Uh, a, a a bushel of wheat or uh, corn or a barrel of oil and the cost it, that you actually have in bringing that forth from the ground, which is which is could varies according to the productivity of the, of the soil, and it has nothing to do with what the landlord actually does. Mm -hmm. um, and so those people they 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 they, they earn uh, the old French term is rent. Uh, rents uh, and they um, they they are only they have them essentially from a right of original con conquest of title that's been passed down uh, and uh, over over uh, years they don't they're not required to be part of the productive process in any material way uh, and uh, so a rentier economy is one in which a very large share of the incomes. Uh, are being paid out in this fashion to people who have acquired title in one way or another. Uh, they, they, they're landowners, or they they have resources to create or to buy uh, equities and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, the, the it's classical income. What it's collected income as rather than yeah, well, it used to be called unearned income. Uh, unearned. Yeah, that was <laughs> the, that was the that was the term in in, in tax law, uh, and uh, that term. Got became unfashionable when the people who were who had unearned income decided that they should call it something else so that they could get it uh, taxed at lower rates, capital gains, and so forth. Um, as any event, um, capital gains they, are what would have traditionally been called unearned income. In realized capital gains, dividends, and so forth. This was this was interest income. So was mm -hmm. was, it, was it income that you didn't work for. Um, mm -hmm. They. Um, Whereas you worked for it, wages or corporate profits were were earned. Um, Any of it. Um, so um, the traditional view of, of of the classical political economists, which I think is a correct view, is that taxes should be focused on rents. Um, and that was uh, you mentioned earlier that, that I've become a, a much more of a of a follower of, of Henry George. Uh, in, than I used to be. I mean, uh, as I became more familiar with the with with, with the work of people who who, was, who really caught my attention, there was a, a gentleman by the name of Mason Gaffney who was passed away just a few years ago. His essays in this area very very engaging, very persuasive. Um, and the, the, the basic principle goes back to David Ricardo. Uh, and uh, just is uh, is is a sol even to even to Adam Smith, it's a solid a solid idea that uh, uh, if you want to um, uh, run the society efficiently, the thing to tax is the unearned component, the rental component of incomes, um, and uh, particularly land value uh, is a good way of getting at that, uh, because that's just essentially taking for public purpose. That which uh, otherwise goes to uh, a uh, a private title holder, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, and that also means that you can lighten the burden on workers and you can lighten the burden on enterprise, uh, and you'll get a get a higher level of employment. Um, lots of other things actually flow from this. Um, well, I, I would I would love to just uh, delve a little deeper into a name you mm -hmm. brought up which is uh, Henry George. And I know Giannis Varoufakis, who's a big fan of your work as well, um, has also brought up Henry George recently. And this is somebody I've been quite astonished to find in, in my own research, was once the third most famous person in America behind, uh, I think Mark Twain and the president were the only people who were more famous right. than Henry George. Right. And of course, I grew up, most people I know have never heard of this guy. I've, I grew up never having heard of this guy. Uh, so can you maybe just tell us a little bit about who this guy was and why he's why he's important to to bring up again? Well, George was a a, a journalist uh, originally in uh, working out of San Francisco, uh, uh, who uh, was an autodidact uh, and who uh, uh, took the basic principles of Ricardian economics and applied them to the American uh, 
uh, situation. Uh, and um, his ideas were very, very influential. They were taken up by the British Labor Party. They were taken up all across the United States. Mm. Uh, they were taken up in China. Uh, Sun Yat-sen was a Georgist and founder of the Chinese uh, uh, modern Chinese state in uh, 1911. Um, and uh, uh, they have very strong, actually, of in, indirect influence on the current can, uh, development of, of the People's Republic. Uh, what was the idea? The idea was that you should place a tax mainly on, uh, on land value. And then if you did that, it would be encouraging, uh, as I said earlier, you would, you would, you would free up labor and, 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 and um, capital, but you would also have a direct effect on landowners uh, who um, are of two types. There are those who are inclined to develop their land and make use of it. And there are those who are inclined to free ride on other people's activity by holding vacant land and holding it until the price goes up and then selling it. And the second type, the absentee, the speculative landlord is a, is a basically a parasitical figure, a parasitic figure. Uh, and so uh, they, the, the idea was that of course you tax the land value, uh, then uh, people can't get away with that because they, they'll just lose, they, they either got to make income out of their land or they'll, they'll, they'll lose, they lose it. Um, a big test of this uh, came in 1906 when an earthquake leveled San Francisco to the ground. Practically everything was totally destroyed. Um, and a year later, uh, they noticed that they, taxes were still coming in because they had taxed the land value and not the, the, the whatever was built on the land. And as a result of that, uh, there was a huge pressure on all the landowners to get busy and build and rebuild, which they did. And very quickly, by five or 10 years later, San Francisco was a larger city than it had been before the earthquake. Wow. Um, and um, the same principles led to the development of all the major Midwestern industrial cities in the United States, whether you're looking at Cleveland or Toledo or uh, Detroit or um, uh, go down the list, Buffalo, New York, cities that were really quite uh, beautiful and uh, you know, important uh, 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 urban achievements. Buffalo had uh, street electric lighting long before Paris did. Um, as a, the original well, power station was at Niagara Falls. Uh, and so these things were, these, the, the, you know, Milwaukee was a major one. This is also called uh, um, sewer socialism. Where you, you, you tax land, you subsidize the infrastructure and the public transit and so forth. Uh, and you've got, you've got very strong urban development. Well, who didn't like that? Who didn't like that were, were land speculators. And land speculators, uh, happened to control universities, and they hired economists. Uh, economics departments were built up to uh, basically uh, uh, deal with this this problem of of, of, of the influence of Georgism. Mm -hmm. but because you can see what's happened, what could happen politically there, is that you had the potential that you would have an alliance of capital and labor against the landlords. Uh, and that would be a very powerful alliance because the capital and labor would prefer not to be taxed. Um, and uh, the Georgists actually also were pretty much open traders, free traders. So a lot of the things, and there's the, the, at least the landlords in a very exposed position. Uh, so they would they they were very much opposed. They basically set, uh, launched real campaigns of of um, uh, of. Um, and the deprecation and uh, 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 assault on 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 Georgism, uh, and uh, of course they 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 uh, perpetrated this through economics departments. This is something which again it goes into Gaffney goes into this in, in a very effective detail, and it was a material that I really hadn't realized or paid close attention to until quite recently. That's that's really fascinating. I mean, when I look at and, and please correct me in any misconceptions that I have here. When I look mm -hmm. at uh, neoclassical economic theory, there seems to be sometimes the outright suggestion that because uh, their perception is that value is more of a subjective thing, economic value is more subjective, that landlords are actually productive. Mm 
they get kind of but, well they conflate if you look at it, neoclassical production theory it has two factors of production labor and capital uh, where's my land? It's missing. Uh, that's been it's been edited out. It's been uh, you know whitewashed off the off the uh, um, out of, out of the photograph, airbrushed out of the photograph. Um, and that's not it turns out not an accidental. Um, I would much rather have uh, a sort of quasi Marxist view uh, in which land uh, plays a very um, secondary or practically no role at all, uh, then deal with the reality, uh, which was the North American reality above all. Uh, land was really important. I mean, this is this, you uh, may have noticed that this is a big continent. Uh, it has. <laughs> we're not we're not dealing with industrial England in the 19th century. Land was important there too, but that not not in comparison to what you're looking at in North America. So. I, I, and I know I, I don't want to take up too much of your time, so I'm going to kind of maybe parse together a very big question that maybe connects some of this and let you fire away at whatever you want to fire away at. Mm -hmm. um, but right now, uh, first off, over here, what we are seeing both in Canada and the United States is big companies um, taking up huge speculative purchases of land um, and then actually holding the keys to empty housing units that homeless people may oh, be yes. sitting right outside of. Um, because they they are good speculative commodities. Um, and then we also at the same time have, and I know you've actually worked in China and seen this, this hands-on, mm. um, this, uh, this supposition we have to be very careful about rocking the boat because whatever discontents there are about neoliberalism, um, extreme poverty around the world is rapidly going down, which is largely accounted for in the People's Republic of China in recent decades which is actually organizing, if I understand what you're saying about land, quite differently around land than we are. It might actually be something that might provoke us to rock the boat in some areas a little bit more. And then uh, yes. I believe, uh, oh, go ahead. Yeah, yeah sure. Uh, I mean, what in, in the United States and Canada, uh, in the middle decades of the last century, 30s, 40s, 50s, mm -hmm. uh, 60s, um, there was of course vast expansion of, uh, of home ownership. Uh, and a distribution, if you like, a, a, there were programs that effectively distributed, distributed land um, to, I mean, this was the whole project of suburbanization. It was, it was not racially inclusive uh, by and large, but uh, it, 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 it certainly created a uh, homeowning class. Uh, and uh, in the first decades of the 21st century, much of that value was wiped out uh, and what you're seeing is a uh, return of those assets under uh, the pressure of foreclosures and uh, speculative uh, busts and, and fraudulent mortgage, mortgage practice, lending practices, uh, to, um, uh, uh, to, la to landlords who's, who's, who are converting things back into rental units. Uh, and that puts um, that basically says that the, the appreciation is going to be in the hands of the of 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 a, of a big landlord rather than uh, smaller ones. Uh, and that's 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 uh, uh, you think about the social implications of that over the long run. Uh, well, it's not hard to figure out what they are uh, there. Uh, and what happened in China? Uh, was a, it was a a very different um, social history. Uh, the 1949 revolution dispossessed the landlords. It was not a, uh, had a, a fair amount of violence associated with that, um, but that's a historical fact. Uh, and as a result, a large share of the land, uh, particularly in, in well all all the land, but it, it, what's particularly important is urban land, uh, is held. Uh, by the uh, regional, provincial, metropolitan government, uh, and as a result, uh, it's um, it, it de facto uh, Georgist in important ways. You, that's it's the, they they can build up infrastructure and, and and collect the rent to fund to collect the rent from the from the uh, buildings, uh, offices and homes and so forth in order the to funding uh, sort of built in. to to plow back into improving the infrastructure. And this mm -hmm. is this is essentially why um, Chinese cities. Uh, 
are unique, uh, practically speaking, in the developing world and having um, no, it was once the developing world was not very heavily developed mm-hmm. uh, in having in having uh, been built up as, uh, as as extraordinarily as as they have. Uh, it doesn't happen in countries where the land remains substantially in private hands and the rents can be plowed away and put socked away into Swiss bank accounts or properties in London or wherever they may be, um, then, then, then you don't see the, the, the funds going into uh, constant revolutionizing and improvement of the infrastructure. And that's what you see in China. That's what has in fact happened. Uh, and of course, one can go and look around and ask, how did this get to be this way? And I think that's the way I've, I've described it as a significant piece of the answer. I'm not entirely sure I, you know, uh, what other factors are running because I'm not an expert on, on public finance in China. Mm-hmm. Uh, but this was pointed out to me some years ago by a, by a Chinese economist and, uh, who had uh, and it made a, the, the point. The point stuck with me as having real significance. Right. Yeah. Um, one last thing that on, on that kind mm-hmm. of brings all of this together um, is that as we look at you know those historical origins and the different things that have happened over time, where we can look at how this is a major influence, and we look at the present world, you suggest that taxing land might actually be the easiest way to address the extreme problems of inequality that we face today, even more so than going after. Uh, the incomes of the super rich. Um, and this is a different approach also from uh, Thomas Piketty, who wrote uh, Capital in the 21st Century. I don't want to go too much into that, though you have pointed out that the title suggests that it's kind of like Marx's Capital, but the measurements are actually very different. Um, so uh, your approach to, to this uh, subject of inequality and how it relates to a land tax is very different from how almost anybody else is thinking about these issues. Uh, can you go into that a little bit? Why is this an effective yeah. way? Well, I think it's true that Piketty uh, uh, conflates land and capital. Uh, and I know Joe Stiglitz has written about this, uh, that his measurement of capital is strongly influenced by land value. Um, they uh, on the on the on the on the broader point about tax structures. I'm not against the income tax, the progressive income tax, of the, uh, but uh, the difficulty of the progressive income tax is that uh, you raise the rates on uh, on on income, and you discover that people take their compensation in, in in some untaxed form, which typically would be unrealized capital gains. So you find a, it, it's it, it's every, to every action on the tax front, there is a um, there's a reaction by the tax lawyer. Um, and so, uh, you know, that's not to say that you can't have an effective tax, but it's a, just a con- constant battle uh, to, uh, um, to keep it effective. Um, the uh, um, difficulty of the wealth tax that Piketty and his colleagues have been advancing uh, strikes me as extreme. Uh, income tax, okay, we know what income is. We, we, there, we have a whole industry of tax accountants uh, who can uh, guide us through the thicket of those laws. Uh, we don't have that for wealth. I mean, if you ask me what wealth is, I would then begin to say, just sort of define it theoretically. If you're going to ask, you're going to say that someone with uh, who owns seventy percent of a um, you know, of a large startup, you know, high tech corporation, and not a startup, but something like Amazon or Microsoft or what have you, uh, is going to have to fork over a certain fraction of that capital value. Uh, on what day of the year are you going to value that? And how is that? How is the? Right. You know, there are all kinds of issues here that strike me as as, as very problematic. You're going to go have uh, someone go 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 evaluate all the real estate and the paintings and so forth. I mean, it doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. Uh, land, on the other hand, uh, is appraised, uh, and that is fixed, and we know who owns it, uh, and we have property taxes at the local level. They work. Uh, the question is more is doing this on a on a more egal a more comprehensive basis. Uh, so, at the statewide or the national basis, then you have uh, you avoid a lot of the inequities that are associated with having high 
value uh, uh, um, tax rates on poor areas and low ones on rich areas, which is what, what the current fractured system achieves. Yeah. Uh, so uh, that's that's a that's a clear cut thing you can do and you can make it stick. And the other thing I like is the estate and, and gift tax. Uh, the estate and gift tax is a wealth tax, but it is only levied on the estate. So the person who previously held the, um, the, the, the property is gone. The, the property is frozen, can't be disposed of until it has been appraised uh, and uh, tax has been levied. And that's fine. Uh, that, 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 that's something you can manage. We have been managing it. It also has a very good um, uh, effect, I think, of encouraging people not to, not to leave big estates. Uh, so the whole point of this is to avoid dynasties. It says, oh, we'll make a distinction. You can, if you want to get rich, fine, get rich. Uh, there are lots of ways to get rich, and many of them are, are perfectly acceptable, even in some cases admirable. Uh, but don't, don't let it lie around. If you get really rich, give it away while you still can. Uh, and there are certain uh, kinds of activities. I, I, I think giving it to universities is perfectly fine. As a university professor, I like this very much. Uh, <laughs> but you know, hospitals, uh, churches, uh, art, uh, in, uh, museums, and theaters, and so forth. There are classes of things that we all basically approve of, and uh, uh, let 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 people to choose what they're going to give things to. I don't think there's anything particularly problematic about that. Um, foundations, okay, there's a, there's some issues, but but in terms of uh, of, of the broad scale of, of that kind of giving, um, you know, that seems to me a perfectly good way. In your 30s and 40s, you make a, a big a big pile, and then you spend the rest of your life uh, patronizing uh, uh, cultural institutions. That's a workable model as far as I can tell. I'm not a perfectionist, I, I like, <laughs> but I like to see things that, that actually do function. Right. Well, I think, thank you so much for this interview, Dr. Galbraith. Um, there are so many other questions that I would love to pick your brain on, but I don't want to take up too much of your time. I think I'm already going a little over time. So That's quite all right. Yeah, it's a pleasure.